Thank you. Well, when uh, I couldn't come to Oxford for various reasons, Professor Fasenko suggested that I make a video. I'm a little bit, I'm trying to, we're trying to make it now. I'm a little bit uneasy about it, giving a lecture with no audience. In fact, it's not quite no audience. My young friend, Anthony Polito from upstairs, has agreed to come and listen so that I have someone to talk to. I hope it won't be too unpleasant for him. Now, the title of the lecture is Problems in the Theory of Automorphic Forms 45 Years Later. 45 years is a long time. Let me recall that in, uh, in early in 1967, I wrote a, a letter to Andre V with several conjectures. And then later, sometime in 1969, I don't have, uh, I don't know the exact date, I gave a lecture entitled Problems in the Theory of Automorphic Forms, which was published in a collection of lectures by Springer Lecture Notes. And that makes the 45 years. Now let me read, start by reading from the, uh, reading the first few lines from the printed version of that lecture. So there's recently been much interest, if not a tremendous amount of progress, in the arithmetic theory of automorphic forms. In this lecture, namely the lecture 45 years ago, I would like to present the views not of a number theorist, but of a student of group representations on those of its problems that he finds most fascinating. To be more precise, I want to formulate a series of questions which the reader may, if he likes, take as conjectures. I prefer to regard them as working hypotheses. They have already led to some interesting facts, although they have stood up for a fair length of time to the most careful scrutiny I could give. I am still not entirely easy about them. Indeed, even at the beginning in the, course of, in the course of the definitions, which I want to make in complete generality, I am forced for lack of time and technical competence to make various assumptions. I should perhaps apologize for such a speculative lecture. However, there are some interesting facts scattered among the questions. Moreover, the unsolved problems in group representations arising from the theory of automorphic forms are much less technical than the solved ones and their significance can perhaps be more easily appreciated by the outsider. Now, 45 years later, much of that is still true, but it's certainly not true that the problems are less technical than, that I said, the unsolved problems are less technical than the solved ones. The unsolved problems are highly technical and highly difficult. Nevertheless, I think one sees, and I feel at least, that one has here the possibility for a theory that encompasses, encompasses is but the strong, it's not too strong a word, but that impinges on many branches of mathematics and requires a very high degree of technical competence of various sorts. You'll see that. Now, the thing is, the, I was invited to, by Professor Fasenko to make this video, but there's a limit of one hour. Now, I have more to say, I think I have more to say, than I can say in one hour. So the intention is to proceed as follows. I will start talking. I have started to talk. I will go on for an hour. I will go on for an hour. And then I will stop and the first video will be over, but there, I will then continue with a second video and perhaps a third, and these will be available on my site, on my website at the Institute for Advanced Study, if you're interested in going further. I can't promise you that I'll stop at a natural place. I'll just stop, more or less, after an hour, wherever I, at whatever point I've reached. So let me remind you what the essential elements or the principal elements of the theory of automorphic forms are. So there, from my point of view, 
there are really three types. One is the theory over number fields. Two is the theory of over function fields. So function fields over finite fields. And the third part, the third type, now all the, not all these uh, aspects of the theory were incorporated in the first lecture. Certainly function fields over finite fields were not particular, were not even considered. And certainly function fields or field of functions of a Riemann surface this is a theory which has been developed in the meantime and which was not at all foreseen in the original lecture and but for all three theories there is basically a global theory that's one and the local theory So we have, there are six possibilities to, con to consider. Now, let me just indicate that this, this part here is, in a certain sense, the most undeveloped of all four. This is only, only on the unramified case has been considered, at least so far as I know, only the unramified case has been considered. The local theory up here is clear. There's an Archimedean theory over the real field and over the complex field. And there's a non-Archimedean theory. So this non-Archimedean theory appears over a number field, but it also appears over a function field, over a finite field. So we have the local theory. And let me just comment briefly on the local theory. So there's a local theory over R and C. Now, that, this local theory means, of course, the representation theory of reductive algebraic groups over R or C, or in this case, over a non-Archimedean field, either of characteristic zero or positive characteristic. So that's the local theory. Now, the local theory is really, I would say, insofar as it's available, the representation theory of, of reductive groups that is due, I don't want to exaggerate, but almost entirely to Harris Chanda. The deep aspects of this theory are, in my view, due to Harris Chanda, although not the initial aspects, of course. So um, I'm, I'm really going a little too far, because I first want to mention, for all, in, for all of these, there are keywords. I forgot to mention the keywords. I, I just want to insert them here before I continue. So the keywords, functoriality, reciprocity, and duality. Now, I, uh, we'll see. Maybe you know already, mo the most of the members of the audience will know already uh, what these words mean, but let me be more explicit. <laughs> these two, functoriality and reciprocity, overlap. For example, if the field is, if the group is GL1, then we're dealing in some sense with class field theory, and in class field theory, these two are fused. It's not, it's not possible to distinguish between them. Uh, in general, it's best to distinguish between them. Uh, they, they will, or they do, so far as anything is understood, require 
by and large, quite different techniques. Duality, you don't see it at all at first. The duality is something special. I would like to keep reserve the word duality for something special, and I'll explain later on what that special thing is. All right, so, so don't think you know exactly what these words mean until I've explained them. There, there are distinctions to be made, and not everyone is careful to make them. All right, and uh, so let me just put in the middle here. I'll erase it, but I'll just put it in the middle. Because Professor Fasenko, Fasenko suggested I comment in this lecture, give a letter, this lecture about a letter to a colleague, Peter Sarnak, in which I describe what I considered the major problems of, of the theory, so a, a brief division into several partial problems. So one was the proof of functoriality. Now that does not mean that I know how to prove functoriality. That means I, I know how I think functoriality in general will have to be proved. There are, of course, all sorts of, there are a large number of special proofs, and so on, but we want to think now in terms of a technique that will give a general proof and create part of what is, I think, could be a very a strikingly beautiful and theory that encompasses a great deal, great many aspects of mathematics. So two will be geometric theory. And for two, two is, is easier than, than the one, I think. But what I want to do for two is to explain what, in my view, this geometric theory should be. Uh, the, it's been, in my view, uh, and I'll, uh, we'll see this later, it's been skewed. It's been skewed because of an undue emphasis on, on sheaves and um, incidentally on stacks as well. So I would like to explain that. I, I would like to create a theory which looks more like the theory over a number field. Now the third point is a point Mere symmetry, and there one needs the, there the word duality comes in. Now, this is something that I have made an effort to understand, that I certainly have not understood, and that I don't think has been properly described. And here, for me, the major problem is to describe whatever this is, which is some kind of mixture or fusion of mathematics and physics, what it is, what it should be, and what it can be. But largely, not for necessarily for practitioners of, of the theory, but for people like myself who just want, want to understand to what extent it is entangled with the other things. And of course, it is entangled with the other things through the geometric theory, but just how has to be explained. And so this problem, here we, there's something to be proven, very, very difficult. Here, there's much to be proven, which is perhaps not quite so difficult. And here, it's more, there's something to be explained. One has to disentangle what that part of the theory, which is, so to speak, largely geometric, largely arithmetic with a little bit of differential geometry. And uh, from those parts which, are, which have a large element of what seems to be purely speculative physics, in other words, the kind of physics that's not accepted by as relevant by many members of the physics community, and one would like to sort of one would like to understand to what extent it's relevant, and to what extent the problems here are new and interesting from a mathematical point of view. The fourth uh, topic is reciprocity. And we'll explain. I'll explain later what reciprocity is. Reciprocity and functoriality, which have to be explained, are 
distinct, but they overlap, and that leads to a considerable amount of confusion. And in particular, for GL1, they overlap completely. So we'll come. This is, I think, by far the most, I won't say it's by far the most difficult part, but from the point of view of automorphic forms as such, this is the part of which we know the least. Huh? This is a letter to Sarnak, and this letter to Sarnak was something I wrote off quickly. It was suggested by a letter to, by a message to Sarnak from me, which was accompanied by uh, a paper by Sarnak and two co-authors. And it's the zeros of automorphic L functions. Uh, zeros of, uh, of families of automorphic L functions. And I think the interest here is the following. At, as, as was clear already in 1969, uh, the theory we're trying to develop here is inspired by the possibility of introducing, that was the beginning really of everything that I've done, of introducing Euler products attached to automorphic forms, which behaved more or less like the classical L functions, or the classical, which should have behaved, in which we could prove in part at least, behaved like the classical zeta function or the classical L functions. But a problem that, so, so the emphasis was from that point on, at least in my mind, on developing methods like functoriality, which would enable one to prove the analytic continuation and the, of uh, all of these automorphic L functions. In my own mind, and I think in the mind of many other people, the question of the behavior of the zeros did not arise. So these are questions which are one way and in another related to the Riemann hypothesis. Now, I think it's fair to say that what, uh, what uh, Sarnak and his co-authors suggest is that one could investigate the zeros of, this, of all of these automorphic L functions from the point of view of functoriality. You'll see that functoriality suggests divisions of automorphic L functions into L functions of various kinds. And what one sees from the papers, one paper or papers, of these authors is that this, the, the zeros depend on what family, the zeros of any given function depend on the family to which it belongs. Now, Sarnak has been thinking about these problems for, for a long time, but I had never really, it hadn't struck me before that they introduced a wholly new aspect into this context, uh, um, namely, it gives us the opportunity to investigate the zeros of a larger family of Euler products, and therefore, an opportunity to think about problems related to the Riemann hypothesis without making any pretense of actually solving the, the problem. All right. So, Please keep this in mind, one, two, three, four, five. I won't say much about this. I, I've never really thought about it. It's just an observation made uh, after receiving this note from Sarnak. I, I want to explain what one, two, three, and four are. I won't say much about three, except that it's something I think which we <laughs> all need to have our ideas clarified, because it's a weak spot. It, it, it's, I find it's, these. I feel quite confident whenever I say anything about one, even two, and four, that I know what I'm doing. But it's, the, it's this part which is the best known because of relation to physics. And it's, in my view, this part which is vulnerable. And so insofar as one, has, <laughs> as one two, and, and four are problems, whose values some people might dispute, I think it's important not to link them too closely with something which you yourself feel is uh, perhaps uncertain. 
And we'll come back to that later. I'll be wrong. Maybe. All right. So I'm going to erase at least this. All right. So now I just want to review briefly. So I want to consider one, the global theory and the local theory. I'm working on the local theory. Now, what should we, before I mention the global theory, uh, what one should say more or less right off the bat, and frankly, is that the non-Archimedean local theory that really doesn't exist yet. It exists partially, so one has some understanding of the situation, but it doesn't exist as a theory. In other words, there is nothing for the non-Archimedean case that resembles the complete theory that Harry Chandra constructed. And that's a very serious weakness. And I don't know, I mean, it's clearly some people are working on this problem from one aspect, one aspect or another of this problem. But I don't not know of anyone who would say, I am trying to solve the problem as a whole. I think I know how to solve it, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of enough, enough labor, enough minds. Somehow there's a, a big gap. So the, insofar as we can do anything at all, we do it without a major element of the, that, that, that's required. So what are the features of a major element? We can describe the features of a ma major element by recalling what Harris Chandra did. It was Harris Chandra's achievement was, in my view, a magnificent achievement and much, much greater than that of many people who are better known than he is. So there are the tempered representations. This is local representations of a group, of a reductive group, G over R, finite dimensional or infinite dimension, or G of C. They're the tempered representation, which are those that are responsible or which carry the harmonic analysis on the group G of R or G of C, as the case may be. So there are the tempered ones, so that is known. And then there are representations of Arthur's type. I, I think that's, I, that's just a convenient I think one can say, I, I've thought about this, but not as much as I should have. In the theory of automorphic forms, there was classically the well-known Ramanujan conjecture. And the, Raman, the Ramanujan conjecture is related to questions of this type. In When we have a discrete group, G of f, so f is a number field, say, and A is the Adels, acting on this, what kind of representations occur? Do they, are they all tempered? Tempered is, so to speak, the class of representations necessary for harmonic analysis on the, on the group G of R or the group G of C. So are the only tempered representations or are the non-tempered representations? And if so, what representations might be non-tempered? Now, as, the simplest representation which actually occurs in L2 of G F over gamma, which is not tempered, is the trivial representation, representation which takes every matrix to one. So if the, when one thinks when one looks at things in this in this way, it obviously violates Ramanujan conjecture. It's not tempered. The question really with Ramanujan conjecture is for G L2 is are there other and is there anything else besides the trivial representation of one-dimensional representations that violates uh, Ramanujan conjecture in the spectrum on this quotient, G of Adels over G of F? And for GL2, at least, you know, over, I, I don't, or at least when F is the rational function field Q, you know that it, it's been shown that there are not. But now, for other groups, the the representations that uh, violate Ramanujan's conjecture, in other words, that aren't tempered and that occur 
in this L2 space are of a much, it's a much more complicated collection, is not fully understood, that I at least don't fully understand. And since Arthur has thought about them, as far as I know, more than anyone else, one usually talks about representations of Arthur type. So they're there and they cause problems and they have to be understood and they will cause problems in, over non-Archimedean fields too. So the representation of Arthur type, now you can think of all irreducible representations. They are classified, but so far as I know, the classification is, is not so hard. It's, it's, uh, it's available, but so far as I know, it's not very important for the theory of automorphic forms. All right, so that's the introduction, basically, to, it's not the full introduction, but that's the introduction to number fields and, and the local theory. As I said, for function fields, it's only the local theory is, is, it has not been touched at all except for the unramified case, which that we'll come back to. So let me erase everything. And continue with the local theory. The local theory, continue with what we need, what we need over the reals and what we need over other local fields, but really in the first case or the second case. So not in the third case because it doesn't, hasn't come up. It, although I think these problems are available. So there's a word to describe this endoscopy. So there, here's the problem. Um, the harmonic analysis on these groups G, these local groups G of F V is a little bit different and a little bit more complicated than harmonic analysis on finite groups. And the reason is the following. There, when one has a G and G prime, harmonic analysis is basically concerned with functions that are equal on conjugate elements in the group. Now, in this kind of context where FV is a field, say the piatic field or the real field or the, or the uh, complex field, then there's another kind of conjugation that one can consider that is G and G prime could be two elements, G of F, V, and one could consider uh, their conjugation not in G of F, V itself, but in the algebraic closure of G of F, V. So, um, and that's a different ball game, and, but it's relevant and it has to be discussed for, um, in all cases, it has to be discussed, I think, over function fields, over Riemann surface, but that's not something we're going to discuss today. So this is endoscopy. Now, there's not so much known about endoscopy as uh, one would like. There was one problem which was solved. namely the fundamental lemma, which is an essential ingredient of endoscopy, but not the only thing. So this is the problem about, well, I would say for good reason, about which quite a bit of fuss was made, and it was solved by Go. And uh, it's a problem that I tried to solve, so I'm happy enough that. And that now is, is, uh, is an ent this endoscopy, so to speak, is the theory which describes how to pass from the, th from the theory for the conjugacy when G and G prime are regarded as conjugate or equivalent if they're conjugate in G of F B of B bar and the standard theory. So endoscopy gives us a passage from what we could c call the stable theory. And the stable theory is a theory of harmonic analysis for functions that are equal, that take equal values on G and G prime G and G prime are conjugate in, in this larger group. 
So that's the stable theory. And then, so one has to have a theory which allows one to pass from the stable theory to the, so to speak, the normal theory. And the fundamental lemma was one aspect of that theory, but it's not the only aspect. There's a second aspect. I, not, not a great deal has been done. There are specialists in endoscopy, and it's very pretty to see their results. It's very pretty to see how, what, what happens is that instead of considering individual representations or individual classes of equivalent representations, one considers finite sets. n is some number which depends upon these. So these would be a set of rep inequivalent irreducible representation in the only in the normal sense, and one has to put them together. Put them together in what have been called L packets. And one instead of studying the characters of pi one to, to pi n, one studies the character of their sum. Perhaps there's some with certain integral coefficients. So one has, so endoscopy is, is really, the, one has to develop, outside of endoscopy, a theory for these functions, for the class functions in uh, st stable classes, namely classes here. And then one has to show what the relation of that theory is and how one can interpret the normal theory or derive the normal theory from that. And that's, so to speak, it's a problem that you have to deal with if you want to deal with automorphic form. But it's just a different problem. And uh, it's a, a lot of people are, have tried to follow all the progress. But a lot of people have thought about that. And the results, if you look at them, are very, very pretty. But they haven't really been put all together. And it's really premature to put them all together in in a, in a single theory. The people who think about these things can be left for a while to think about them. They seem to be doing fairly well. So if, if we're going to do this, then the functions we get, the, the functions from which all other functions are supposed to be built, are not the characters of the individual ones, but the sum of their characters. And I won't try to, you may want to put in coefficients. Uh, that's an, another aspect of endoscopy. And this would be the character of the stable representation. So it's not an irreducible representation. It's a, it's a stable class and represented by those elements. But this function then would be a class function, a stable class function in the sense that two elements are conjugates in g of f b bar. Then this character takes the same value on them. So that's the class. And what one does then, so this says uh, the theory is not available. An adequate theory at this le local theory at this level is not available. But one has to, when reflecting on the possibilities, accept that it's in that context, accept that whatever one does, one is implicitly assuming this possibility and at the present time and proving it when, when one can. And accepting that, for the moment at least, one can't prove it in general. So that's endoscopy. That's it. But with endoscopy comes a second problem, which I would call stable transfer. So this is probably, maybe many people in the audience have heard of endoscopy. They will not be so many that have heard uh, stable transfer, in fact, the little is known. So here's this even over R, as far as I know, although they're presumably possible to do what I want to do. So this is related to functoriality, which we haven't really discussed, but uh, let's just see what it is. Um, suppose we have two groups, H and G. So these are reductive groups over a local field for the, for the moment. And then we have associated to them, and I have to take for granted that you've heard 
of this. I think everyone has heard of this, although they might not know exactly the L group associated to HSA. This, this, is the, this is the group over the local field, Fd. This is the group over the local field, Fd. These, on the other hand, are groups over C. And they're not necessarily, they may not be connected because there's a Galois element there. Now, so suppose one has these two groups, an homomorphism from HL to GL, which is, which is, what, which is compatible with sort of the disconnected part of this, which is to be related to a Galois group. So they have the same disconnected, or the same quotient by the, by the connected component of the identity, and that's some Galois group. And suppose we have this. Then any theory that will work is supposed to. Sometimes one can do this. Most of the time, one can't yet do it. Uh, so that would be one would have a class for H, a stable class. This would give us functoriality uh, a transfer from. So if we have a, a C, so this transfer would depend. This is a homomorphism from this group into this group. Then functoriality, which is one of the things we're trying to prove globally and locally, would give us a, a map from this set into this set. With what properties? We have to just, so first thing, let's deal with tempered re representation. But then what has would have to be extended to a certain class of non-tempered representation. Those of our art and type. So this is a pr now we come to a problem which has been there from the beginning. From the beginning, what we want to do is have not only C, but some kind of dual um, C, which would take us from a function on G to a function on H, but not a specific function. Some kind, it's got some kind of correspondence. We inverse to this. And the idea would be, well, this is a represent, this is a stable representation, so it's a, so it's a sum of, of irreducible representations with certain coefficients, and so it has a character. And what we would want is that the chi, the stable character of FH for the over here would be equal to so chi so I, 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 I will stop for a minute and hope that this is that this sinks in namely for any FG say on, on G of FD is a function, say smooth of compact support. There's another function, by no means unique, on G, uh, on H of FD, FH. So given FG, there is an FH such that this relation is true for uh, any tempered stable, stable class here and its image over here. So, so if this is known in principle, if we're trying to construct the theory, if this is known, this is known, and then for an arbitrary function fg, we can find in at least one fh, which is also smooth of compact support, so that this equation holds. Now, what am I doing? I'm trying to set up a, we want to prove functoriality both locally and globally. And that statement there is, is a local statement. And one has to assume, as I said, we don't have a, we have a theory over the reals or the complexes, and certainly their functoriality follows rather readily from the work of Harris Chandra. I mean, rather readily, uh, that's an exaggeration, but I think it will follow. And 
this property has not, although shows that I believe is thinking about it, this property, namely the existence of a transfer, the existence of this transfer, is perhaps something that one can think of proving for over the reals and the complexes. In other words, the, the techniques are there that one, one, can, one can think of working with Harris gender and developing Harris gender methods to the point where one can prove this. But over non Archimedean places, but one doesn't have a local theory, so F with theory one does not have a stable transfer. Nevertheless, you cannot get anywhere without it. So the gap that I mentioned, the gap that I mentioned at the beginning, namely the absence of a real, genuine, and complete local theory over non-Archimedean fields, is, is a genuine problem. It has to be solved. Now, what I want to do. I want to, what I want to suggest next in connection with problem one, in connection with, so local functoriality is not to be thought of the most serious problem. The serious problem is global functoriality. And I want to try to describe that, because that, as I said, that was my problem one, global functoriality. Can we, is it, do we have any notion of how we're going to solve it? Uh, so I, this means, do we have any notion of how we can solve it if we can solve the local problems, which, on my view, are uh, not at the same level? And this is what I want to comment on. And I'm going to. I think that's as far as I'm going to get in this first lecture. And, uh, but let me try to get to it in the first lecture. There's a lot to swallow in the next 15 minutes, which when the, when the first lecture will end. Um, and I, I may not even get to it, but I'm going to maybe go a little further than my allowed hour, because this, it seems to me, is so important. So. Uh, I want to use the trace formula, and I want to use the existence of local transfer. Notice that this local transfer is no problem almost everywhere. So insofar as we're dealing with an unramified situation, the local transfer is not a problem. Local transfer comes from the theory of spherical functions. By the way, I, I should say this. I haven't emphasized it in connection with endoscopy, but once one has endoscopy, global theory is, is to be done for quasi-split groups, quasi-split groups. So over the global field. Uh, you should think of the theory for other groups, say groups associated with quaternion algebras, uh, as being a consequence of that. So there are, there are lots of explanation, various papers about in what sense and how one might get the theory over a general, of, of, of general algebra, of general reductive groups from the theory for quasi-split groups. The, the theory for quasi-split groups that is central into once one, and it's the, not only is it the that, but it's a stable theory. We're going to work with a stable trace formula. The theory of endoscopy, one of its goals is to have a stable or a stabilized trace formula. So it's, it's a goal which is partially realized, partially not realized. And uh, one has to work on it. But what we want to understand, and that's what I want to explain, is that 
once we can get all these elements in place, then there is the central problem left over, and that is proving global functoriality. So we have to take local transfer for granted. Let's, let's take it for granted. Now what I want to see is local transfer is simple for a spherical function. It's simple, and I don't want to go into too much detail. There's not much time. Namely, it uh, follows from the th theory for the Frobenius, what I would call the Frobenius Hecke class. And what other people would call the Sataki class. Uh, now, the theory of the Frobenius Hecke class, uh, class without that name, it was developed very briefly in the letter to Vey and more expen at more length in the lecture, which has been printed from 45 years ago. I don't know quite how it come, came to be called the Sataki class. It was never given this name. It was never given a name. I used it and developed its theory. And, 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 uh, but I, I explained why, where it comes from. It comes from the fact that let me just say this. I, in particular, searched for at least two years for in the years 65 to 67 for a theory of, general theory of automorphic L functions. And then I discovered a theory, and I discovered a theory when I noticed that the L functions that I was looking for appeared in the context of Eisenstein series. And that's, so when I saw that, that's when I wrote the letter to Vey, and that's what I introduced, essentially, this Robinius Hecker class without giving it a name. And I, I find it very strange, I don't want to discuss it here, that this name came in and Sataki's name came in because what Saki, Sataki had, been, had done is it was, of course, it would be better to say, have said Bruhas Sataki, I believe. But whatever they had done was certainly incorporated into the definition of this class, as I gave it, without a name. But this was less and not so hard to get. I don't think they had to think about think two years rather in a rather despairing way in order to get it. So I've explained this. In, if you look on my website and you look in the explanation accompanying a brief letter to Müller Bopato, you'll see that I try my best to explain why I think this name is important. I don't know just how uh, this name came to be so popular. I asked one of the people who uses it. <laughs> Uh, and he just sort of said, he, he, he wrote, mea culpa. Uh, so so <laughs> he, he accepted a, he just said I didn't look very carefully. Uh, I, I think it was introduced by people who didn't, so to speak, understand the context. But in any case, anyone who wants to see what my arguments are in favor of this uh, uh, name can look at uh, my website in connection with the letter to Müller Vopata, which is in section four. All right. So we need this local transfer. In any case, and as I say, the local, local transfer is no problem almost anywhere. Now, let me try to tell you. So let's suppose we have all that. Then how are we going to prove global functoriality. That's what I want. Now, you'll see that this, what I'm proposing is no easy matter, in other words. So you'll see I propose that in the course of these lectures, I'll propose actually for the first various things that one might do if one wants to work on question one, two, three, or four. And what we'll also see is that I 
thought myself just at length about maybe two, three, not four, but two and three. One, however, is, is a major undertaking. And I think it's such a, it's a major undertaking. It's not an undertaking that's appropriate for someone my age. It's <laughs> not appropriate for someone who wants to win the Fields Medal either, because it's going to take more time than that. So it's a major effort. And um, you will have to know a great many things. You have to master, I think, a great many things. And I'll explain what they are. Uh, in order to do it. So it won't, it's not something for sissies. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know whether anyone will actually have the courage to do After hearing what I have to say and what I propose, you know, I, I know one or two people who've done some work along these lines, even important and interesting work. But I think they're being discouraged because they're being told, you know, <laughs> Chairman of your department won't understand why you're taking so long. The dean won't understand why you're taking so long. NSF won't understand why you're taking so long. And so it's something that only a person with courage will undertake. So let me describe, first of all, what one needs, will need to know. Uh -uh. Um, one, one will need to know to understand the trace formula. So in the sense of Arthur, and not the twist, twisted trace formula, the trace formula, stabilized. So a stabilized trace formula. So one that will have to do all the work that's necessary. But you can look at particular cases. And it, you don't have to, no one will have to solve the whole problem together. It would be, good, it would be enough to understand how, how true cases work. So you'll need this table. And you probably have to understand it in the way that Arthur understands it. And you will need to know a good deal of analytic number theory. So the kind of number theory that, so really you want to deal with, with what, what do they call it? Dirichlet series so to the form summation alpha n or n to the x. As one does in analytic number theory and prime number theory theorem and so on, one will have to understand various things about those, how to estimate their behavior near s equals 1 and so on, how to understand their behavior. And what else? Now, uh, the last point I'll, I'll describe later, but what I've said in letters to various people, in particular to Prof Professor Fasenko, is that one should go back maybe to say Haas's sometime in the 1930s, notes on uh, Class field theory. When I say this, I think everyone misunderstands. Namely, it isn't a question of going back and then seeing all the slick methods that were later used uh, to, to get the same result or to make the same calculation, come to the same conclusion. One has to have, one has to acquire an an acquisition that would only come with time, many years, some feeling for how you count, how you make two different countings, and I'll explain that later, and how you come to the conclusion that those two different countings are equal. And you have to do it. So it's a question of counting what the trace formula gives you on one hand, in a certain sense, what you get by the counting the number of solutions of this or that Diophantine equation on the other. And you have to know the, understand those things so well that you can pr prove that these two numbers are equal. And uh, that will be hard, very hard. And as I say, 
you know, in the current mathematical atmosphere, it may be that no one has the courage to try it. Now, I've taken up one hour, at this, but, but I've sort of made, I've been, I'm encouraging you to come back for the second hour when I will try to explain. I won't be able to explain it very well because the idea is slight, it, it's vague. You'll see it's precise on the one end, but vague on the other. And uh, to execute it, one would need a great deal of experience and a great deal of reflection on very concrete cases and a great deal of knowledge of various things that most people, if anyone, do not have. So that's the first hour. And for the other hours, unless Professor Fesenko, to whom I'll send the videos, allows you to look at them in your leisure time during the conference, you'll be able to look at them on my website at the Institute. Thank you. And thank you, Tony, for listening. <laughs>